Welcome everyone. My name is Susan Patterson. I'm the director of Through God's Grace Ministry, who serves as the platform for the National Black Faith Coalition Against Sex Trafficking, who is the host for our event today, The True Reality of Pimping and Prostitution. If you're someone who is really serious about taking action in the fight against sex trafficking and child exploitation, please do go to our website, throughgodsgrace.com, where you can find videos, books, and events like this. For our event today, by understanding how truly destructive the life of prostitution is, we move forward on preventing women and boys from entering this exploitive life. And given that many prostitutes wind up as victims of sex trafficking, we're also preventing that. If we're gonna serve the needs of victims, we need to understand their mindset. While there are two sociopaths who make up the group of sex traffickers, many are forced into becoming recruiters into the gangs and then they're later promoted into becoming a pimp. The former sheriff of Los Angeles tells the story of a boy who refused to join the gangs. Then the gangs met up with him and showed him a video of them raping his sister. Then they told him if he didn't join the gangs, next time they would show him a video of them killing her. I'm not suggesting that we don't lock up gang members or pimps. We have a right as a society to protect ourselves from those who would cause us harm. However, as a church, we can do a better job of working in partnership in our communities with nonprofits to prevent gang violence and reach out to boys like this. Armand, who's one of our speakers, can advise you on what you can do. And his contact information is in the video description below. In every business model, there's supply, demand, and the middleman. As anti-human trafficking participants who are part of that community, we are hyper-focused on taking care of the needs of the victims. The problem is that if we don't figure out how to eliminate demand and the middleman who are the traffickers, we will continue to limp along as this issue continues to grow. At anti-human trafficking conferences, we rage at the traffickers. We hate the buyers and we're angry with the prostitutes because they're making the situation worse for our anti-human trafficking efforts. <clears throat> However, there are pimps who call nonprofits who take care of victims to ask for help and these nonprofits are not prepared to help them. For this event, we're giving a former pimp and a former prostitute a voice so that we have a better understanding of what has people enter this life. With that understanding, we can be better equipped to help them. One of the points Armin makes is that on almost every school campus now, there are recruiters, which means that at our church, we have people who are involved in this, whether as a pimp or prostitute, there may be women who are participating in platforms like OnlyFans, sugar babies, things like that. They need Jesus, but hesitate to go to church because they're afraid of being shamed. We can serve them by simply including them in what we're doing, like inviting people to come forward for prayer. So we would invite people who have cancer, who are victims of domestic violence, but also those who are perpetrators of domestic violence because they are hurting too. Many of them have been abused by their mothers. We also want to invite forward anyone who's trapped into darkness, like pimps, prostitutes, pe strippers, people like that, by simply including them and calling it out by name, they will feel included. The last thing I want to do is just show you three slides so you have a sense of what our youth and people in their 20s and 30s are seeing through social media so that you understand how to address this issue. Here we have one of many YouTube videos telling future pimps how much money they can make. Most people think pimps look like the guy on the bottom, very sleazy looking, but many are actually clean cut, good looking, smart guys like the guy at the top. These are the guys who are attending college parties, clubs where college students hang out because the buyers have told them they don't want a depressed foster child. They want a college girl to party with. In this one, we have a woman telling other women they can make half a million dollars a year. You want to notice that she has 565,000 views, 8.2 likes, not one dislike. 
What you want to note about this video that's significant is she's not hard looking like a drug user. She's actually very soft looking. She could be any girl's friend, which makes us very attractive. I spoke at a conference and there I met a woman who had a look like this. She was a petite blonde and she got into the life for the money. She was from a middle class family. She wasn't desperate and at the beginning she thought it was great. She was making a lot of money partying. She had more clients than she could handle. She recruited a lot of women into the life with her. She gave them her clients. They split the money which technically made her a pimp. However, over time, the life ate at her. And at the end of three years, she was suicidal. So she got out. But in her case, she had the resources to get out. That's not true for everyone who's in this life. Lastly, what our youth and people in their 20s or 30s are being told that this is a job like any other job, a legitimate way to make money. However, none of these videos are talking about the violence. The Prostitution Research and Education Organization interviewed 130 prostitutes in San Francisco. And what they found are in these statistics. You want to notice that over half reported being assaulted and or raped. One of the things that the director of a nonprofit who provides services to survivors of prostitution and human trafficking shared is that not everyone that they worked with wanted to get out of the life. Many of these women were referrals who had been caught up in a sweep and been turned over to them from law enforcement. She was very confused by this because of how traumatic the stories were that they had to tell. However, over time, what she learned from the survivors is that while they were involved in the life of prostitution, they learned to compartmentalize or disassociate from the trauma. They really didn't start processing it until they got out, which is one reason why many of them are choosing not to get out. Without further ado, I want to turn this event over to Jermika Cost, who will be introducing our awesome speakers. Jermika is a board member for the nonprofit, The Underground New England. Let's join the event now. Perfect. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are across the country and the world. Uh, my name is Jamika Cost. I am coming from the great state of Connecticut where it's snowing in March uh, after spring has already started. So I don't know where you are uh, in the world, but I'm hoping you're not seeing snow, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so I am actually going to uh, just share really quickly. Uh, I was up at midnight uh, about a year ago and I was watching YouTube and one of the videos from this ministry came across the screen and it changed me forever. And so I am believing that these conversations are pivotal, um, not only in our country, but across the world, because wherever we go, we carry a message that's needed. And so thank you all for joining us on today. Uh, I am introducing today Armand Lorich King and Jamie Johnson. Armand King, a survivor of toxic lifestyles, transformed himself to be a role model and a leader in his community and around the world. For the past 12 years, Armand King has been dedicated to positively impacting communities and individuals through his work as a successful nonprofit builder, consultant, and author of books and curriculums. His powerful program for at-risk youth entitled Walk With Me Impact is saving scores of youth from making toxic choices. He is a lived experience expert with regard to the true reality of prostitution and the book that he is co-writing with Jamie Johnson entitled From the Streets to the Suites. It is key to convincing both pimps and prostitutes to lead the life as it teaches them how to use their street skills to obtain a high paying career. Armand is also a sought after keynote speaker and trainer, frequently invited by experts from all over the globe to share his expertise. He is skilled at helping people develop their projects and build strong teams. Currently, Armand King serves on the San Diego's Gang Prevention and Intervention Commission and is a member of the San Diego Mayor's Black Advisory Board. With his powerful message and ability to change lives, Armand King is a force 
for good in the world. Jamie Johnson is a lived experience expert on domestic sex trafficking and chief executive officer and founder of Sisters of the Streets. She also holds the title of mother, motivational speaker, advocate, first responder, consultant, social media marketer, excuse me, social media marketeer, entrepreneur, and activist. Mm -hmm. Sisters of the Streets focuses on empowering those impacted by sexual exploitation. Ms. Johnson integrates her lived experience into her work by providing mentorship and resources to be a part of the solution while identifying and addressing root issues that allow exploitation to thrive while encouraging harm reduction practices. Without further ado, Armand King and Jamie Johnson. Thank you, good morning. Thank you, thank you, good morning. That's uh, I, good. I like that intro. Thank you. It made me, it, it was like, um, I feel like I'm not doing enough. Is that the person that's on the phone today? He needs to do more work. <laughs> I got to live up to all that good stuff. Made me feel like I'm not doing enough. I'm like, let me <laughs> get my stuff together. He got it. His bio is legit. I need to add things. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, bro, I'm going to, I'm going to let you start it off. So, so speak, speak first and let's let it flow. Okay, um, so it's early in the morning. I'd, I'd have my first cup of coffee, and I, I believe, you know, it's early in the morning for me. As we heard, we have people all over the world on here on this international call today. So um, some people might be on a third, fourth cup of coffee. But let, let's let this speech and that prayer, that in, invigorating prayer, that had me, um, thank you for taking me to church this morning. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Susan, thank you for having us. And I started writing notes as you were talking, Susan, like I, I, we, me and Jamie, we almost got together yesterday and prepared for this. And we kind of came to the, to the, you know, we've presented before in front of dignitaries, in front of scholars. We've run uh, trainings at, at UC at USD for um, uh, multiple days for educators and people, uh, grad students. We've done it all. And one thing we, we kind of came to a conclusion yesterday that we didn't need to prepare necessarily. We just speak our truth. And as um and and let 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 the spirit move us as as the saying goes. And right now, when I was um I was listening to you do the intro, Susan, I started writing down the notes that I of things that I, I feel like I want to deliver to this great great group today. And um I'm just gonna uh, start off. Um we I believe majority of people and sorry if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe uh, most of you have an um uh, at least a basic understanding of human sex trafficking in general, you know, um, and my disclaimer for, my, for myself, and I'll speak for myself, not, Jamie, of course, speaks for herself as well. Um, I come from a background that's now called human sex trafficking, but as I grew up in the inner city and the urban communities, the hood, black and uh, mostly uh, communities of color in, in America, San Diego is where I'm from specifically, we just called it pimping and prostitution. The human sex trafficking wasn't a word we related to or even knew existed till around 2014, 15, 16, as this term came about. Uh, pimping and prostitution was heavily promoted to us through media, through, um, through hip hop music. It was okayed. It was not a bad thing. It was, it was a lifestyle that was acceptable and encouraged highly. Um, coming from, you know, my previous generations of family members that were heavily involved in the crack epidemic, uh, um, you know, that, that terrorized communities of color throughout the United States. Then what came in right shortly after, and I'm looking at where a lot of people are from, and I see a lot of Southern California in here, so I know y'all are very familiar with the gangs that came about, uh, emerged about the, um, the crack epidemic. So I'm a byproduct of that. Um, so these notes that I, I started off with, you know, I, I really want to concentrate on prevention. Like, yeah, pimping, um, a lifestyle that I got involved in as a kid, as a 16 year old boy, um, when it was, you know, really force fed to us, um, so far removed from that, for, you know, for as a lifestyle for myself and I, for the past 12 years, I've been helping people out of the lifestyle and um, from helping people in all areas from kids, babies to, um, to, to children of people in the game to people that have been in the game for 20 plus years. I've helped all, all through the, the spectrum. 
And I've found over my time of creating programs, services to help people, it is way harder to get someone out that has been in for years, four, five, six years, psychologically brainwashing themselves to and being brainwashed to believe that this is all they're worth and all they can do. And the more deeper you go down that rabbit hole of this lifestyle, the farther you remove yourself from squares, parents, the church, your, your, your friends that aren't involved, and that's male and female. So my, my, my new phase in life and where God has me concentrating on is just straight prevention. I want this young man and young woman to never think that that human trafficking, that pimping and prostitution is something feasible and something for their life, which kids still to this day do. And um, before I, um, I, I close the mic for the second and let Jamie in is um, um, starts at home. And I, I, I quickly flash back to me and my friends. We were all in some kind of way in the church already at, as kids, even as we entered into the game. Our parents were heavy, heavily church involved, our mothers, um, and we were in the church. And so I want us to, you know, as many of us have, have different levels of advocacy and out in the streets and different outreaches and stuff. But if, uh, I, if my assumption is correct, a lot of you have something to do with the church. If you're looking for a place to start and have immediate impact, I would start home first. Those kids that are either in or potentially going in are already in your congregation right now. And if you have your hand and grip on them, still not, not to discourage you from doing your street outreach, please do. We need all the help we can get out here. But don't neglect or be naive enough to think that those children aren't already in your house and they need you. Um, one uh, recently, I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Pastor Terry Brooks from Bayview Baptist Church here invited me and my, my survi other survivor sister to, to actually share the pulpit on all three, three uh, sermons on, on a Sunday morning when they were packed out. He sat aside and let us lead the, the, the church. And so many people after we uh, to speak about human trafficking, so many people that had no idea we were doing this came out from the stands. One time we had a pimp and a prostitute that were there together, the couple that walked up and said, you had no idea. I didn't know why I, was came, I came here today, but I came to hear this. They're in your congregation right now, you know? So uh, Jamie, sorry, you get me running. Let me, you stop, hey, you stop me too, go my time out, you know, jump in. Again, my name is Jamie Johnson. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be having this conversation. Um, I believe that sometimes we go into these these events and we see certain words like we see sex trafficking or we see pimping and we see prostitution or we see exploitation. We have all these terminologies coming at us all the time, right? And for me, what's really important, um, you know, I'll start kind of before I get to the solutions, which I'm sure that's always what we want to close things out with. Um, we can't really understand the solutions until we understand the vulnerabilities. And for me, when I, uh, just like Armand, I never identified, I, I categorize things, right? Pimping and prostitution, prostitution, um, hoeing, um, the lifestyle, whatever we want to call it, everything outside of sex trafficking or exploitation is what I knew until I got into an area where what I have come to conclude is that we try to label things so that we can better understand them in our minds. Um, we need to be able to identify something and be able to understand others' experiences to our limited experiences. And so it's easier to put a name on something. And something that I would like to talk about <clears throat> is how that's a vulnerability. Trying to separate what exploitation is um, as a whole and where it comes from in our society is a big part of how it continues to thrive. So what I mean by that is oftentimes when we talk about vulnerabilities, we'll look at race, we'll look at um, social economical classes, we'll look at all the, these outside factors that are, they are vulnerabilities, but they're very surface as well. We don't talk enough about the root vulnerabilities, um, which Armand is amazing. His book is amazing, uh, Raising Penn City, to talk about those things and really understand the dynamics that have created the systems in place that are actually pimping us. So when we talk about pimping, we're thinking of one person exploiting a group of people or a person, an individual. 
we rarely talk about how we are all victims of societal pimping. I'm not sure if that's a, a actual term, but it's a term that I identify with. Um, and so where my vulnerabilities came from is my lack of knowledge from somebody actually coming in at a young age and telling me that I have A and B opportunities. So instead, all I saw as my opportunity was what was around me, product of my environment, right? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, my dog is like licking my toe. It's weird. So I'm trying to get her, get her off of me. Um, so as I was growing up, I use this example often. I knew that there were people that become doctors. I knew that there were people that become lawyers. I knew that there were people that become um, actors and all these other things, right? Because I see them, but I never knew that that was an option for me because that wasn't what was around me. So all I thought to my limited capacity was that I could be what either my mom or my dad or the people around me were. And so without somebody coming in to, before we hit those needs to need services and need resources, prevention, before, without someone coming in to let me know that I have opportunity or I have options or I have support, I'm never going to know that. So we live in a very reactive society. And uh, what that creates is the ability to feed our minds, especially with social media, um, what is acceptable. And currently, that is really where our youth are struggling because it is fed to them constantly that this is an okay way to sustain life. We're not talking about the things that happen behind closed doors. We, we're not talking about the other side of the coin, right? Like, yes, there can be some great things that come from having fast money. And that's just the reality. My experience was not all bad. My experience was not just horrific. And I wasn't just having these abusive, horrible days every day. My uh, personal experience, I got into, um, without knowing, I got into um, CSEC, which is child sexual exploitation at 15. Um, automatically, we know and can identify that that's sex trafficking because I'm a minor, I can't, I can't consent. Um, there's these factors that are involved that it's, it's very set in stone what that is. Now, going into my adulthood, that shifts a little bit, right? Now I'm into prostitution. I get pulled into that world, not because somebody kidnapped me or threw me in a trunk or tied me up in a basement, but because my vulnerabilities and young childhood being exposed to domestic violence, being exposed to addiction, being exposed to survival um, from a very young age led me to believe that that was an acceptable lifestyle or a way for somebody to treat me. And it helped me to see a way out in my eyes. It was a faster way to get out of where I wanted to be, which I was trying to do anyways, go to school, go to college, do these things, but, or I could come over here and do A, B, and C and get out a lot faster, right? So getting to my end goal, I thought was what the goal was. And I didn't understand what was going to come along with that experience. So my experience of wanting to quickly get out of my survival turned into actually traumatizing me more later down the line, six years later. So my adulthood became me just trying to figure out how to survive something that I allowed to come into my life that was supposed to help me. Um, and so we're supposed to use this thing, you know, pimping and prostitution as a stepping stone, and that's all a lie. Um, and that's basically what it is. There's not really any gray area to that. There's very few successful stories of people that get into pimping and prostitution that really make it out at the end and that chapter is closed and it's all good. I don't really know any. Zero. Right. Now, are there good experiences and things that happen within that? Yes. Um, and so, you know, I know there's, there's a lot of thoughts that can be all over the place. So I apologize if my thoughts are like, are scattered, but I think what I want to just kind of conclude the vulnerability part with it is that the lack of resources, not the lack of resources, the lack of knowledge of resources, the lack of the real conversations. I, those, those stats that Susan um, put up as I was reading them, um, if somebody would have presented those to me beforehand, it might have shifted a thought in me to at least it might not have prevented me from going into that lifestyle, but it might have given me something to think about because majority of those were very true for my life. It got to the point where just being real and raw that it came to the point where I looked somebody, one of my customers in the eye when I knew that an assault was about to happen and I was so used to those assaults happening. By this time, probably had been raped about 12 to 15 times. It was so normal that it 
it kind of just made me laugh and kind of scoff like, is that what you're going to do? Because you can't really harm me anymore because it's already been done. And so those things become, those compartmentalizations become very um, easy. We easily disassociate. And I also want to address as we go into more of the solution aspect, um, those things don't leave once you leave that lifestyle. Those survival skills do not just turn off just because I stop turning dates or I stop messing with pimps or I stop um, selling my body. Those things don't turn off. And so as we shift into the solutions and we talk about how to prevent things, I think a bigger part of what is important to me to talk about and keep on your minds is the aftercare. Um, because unfortunately, that's where we're, we're gonna, not going to get to ending this issue anytime soon. Um, there's a lot of things that have to happen in between time. And so we're losing a lot of people in the aftercare aspect and how we're approaching it. And we're losing a lot of people um, in the aftermath. In my personal experience, a lot more people are being lost in the healing part and trying to get out of the streets than actually in the streets. Um, and so I really do want to talk more about the solutions and we can talk about what the details, what my vulnerabilities were, how I got there, what I did in between, but really what matters is in the now. And with that, I would like to um, point out that when Susan was speaking earlier, my my heart, my hardest healing part and the hardest part of all of this is is the now. It's It wasn't when I was in the fast lifestyle, some of that sucked, but I really don't remember too much of that. What I know now is that me facing all of those things and really trying to stay at it to do the right thing, not go backwards, not hustle fast money, not go back to my survival skills. This has been the most trying time to get through that and really push through that. And so we need to come together on the resource side to be having those conversations of how we support people in that aftercare, um, because this is where we're losing people. Not in, we are losing people to the streets, but we're losing so many more people's minds, bodies, and just the, their hope to be able to move forward as things get harder, more expensive, and more trying. And so, um, hopefully, some of that rounded out and made and you know made some sense. Um, and we can jump into kind of more the solution aspect. But at the end of the day, I also would like to point out that although my vulnerabilities come from very like lack of resources. We have to also keep our minds open that this is not just a one culture issue, one area issue. Um, plenty of people that I do know come from middle class, higher class, neighborhoods, families, um, and get sucked into these things because for the simple fact that it's easily socially acceptable. It's okay. It's okay. It's no, there's no shame behind the word prostitute. There's no shame behind the word hoe anymore. This is something that is actually glamorized and sought after. It's almost added to the list that, that kids are turning into, hey, you want to be a doctor? You want to be a lawyer? Oh, you want to be a hoe? You want to be a stripper? It's very socially acceptable because it's so glamorized. And so we have to start seeing how we're not only um, counteracting that, but how we're allowing that in our own lives to be a part of, of being okay. And once we can identify and shift that, then we can speak to these youth in a real way that are, is going to really resonate with them to help them understand that, yeah, you might get the gold over here, but look what you got to do to get there. And so having those conversations is going to be really helpful um, in, in that prevention aspect. So take the mic back, bro. Jamie, and just a really quick, because I see a couple hands up, but you touched on some things that, that hit me. And I, um, one thing for this entire group, please recognize that human sex trafficking prostitution is by far not new to this country at all. It is exactly how this country was founded on labor trafficking, sex trafficking. It has always been here. Go watch Gunsmoke and look at Kitty, the, the, the madam. Go look, go, go back at, you know, when back in the day when Massa used to just be able to go and take and rape what he wanted. And then, then it turned into a, a deal being done and money being left. Trafficking is the root of this country. It's not a, oh, this is a new epidemic. If anything, it was, it was more intense 20 years ago than it is now. But it's never left. It's always been here. It's not new. 
And the same vulnerabilities that Jamie spoke on, I want to make sure this is in your minds too, that lit, that lead a woman into the lifestyle, a young girl into the lifestyle of pimping and prostitution are the same exact vulnerabilities that led that man into that lifestyle, more than likely. Out of the hundreds of people I know, you compare their backgrounds. They came from similar backgrounds, similar vulnerabilities, and it led them into a lifestyle. One just went towards the pimp, one went towards prostitution, and they went that direction. So um, definitely right. want to point those out. So root cause, root causes, and the only options, as she mentioned that, that's, then I'll stop here, but the only options, um, growing up as a young Black man, I'll put myself in middle school. At that point, I thought my only options were to gang bang, sell drugs, or pimp. That's what I thought. Previous to that, and I, I, I do work in middle schools now, the same middle school I went to, and you ask, I always ask the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? You hear the same things, like some kind of sports star or entertainer, even though, yeah, doctors exist, lawyers exist, architects exist, engineering exists, there's STEM classes on top of STEM classes on top of STEM classes that keep coming. We're tired of these STEM resource fairs, by the way, anyway, anyway, we, we, we know this exists. But if you don't have that self-belief, if no one's teaching you to look into those things and you can't do them and you're count trying to counter the, the music you're listening to, a media is pumping to you and what you see in your box of a neighborhood, some make it out. Not everybody. Some people, you know, we got a lot of great people in the community that move out and do things and go to college. But the bulk of them, they, they fall into that trap. So those options are limited and it go, you know, from like me, I realized I couldn't play, I couldn't play sports at all by the time it was time to play sports. Nope. And I can't sing or dance. So what, what are my options now? Gang bang, sell drugs or pimp. And I did all three. And what happens with that? Death and incarceration. And that most of my friends are dead. Out of eight of my best friends, I'm one of four still alive. This past, the past two years, 2021, I lost a loved one every single month of the year seven mentees it's still happening today still burying friends i just buried one of my survivor sister friends three weeks ago this is um so it has not changed and the, that lack of opportunity and resources and true education is still missing and um we have those hands i, I hope that was brief enough i see my and brother before, and before i you know our time on this on this area um closes out i i wanted to mention um at, I, we touched on glamorization or I spoke on it, glamorization a little bit and that's just exactly what it sounds like um glamorization can be anything from from only giving one side as Susan had mentioned in that in that video we only give the side that's good right and we all know that the coin always has two sides so that we only give that that's glamorizing glamorizing also though is how we as a society create the acceptability and also sugarcoating, right? Sugarcoating is a big part of glamorization. We call it, we call, we call the sex industry all types of different things. Everything from prostitution to sugar babying to sugar daddy to stripping to um, entertainment because it's pornography. By the way, um, you know, I think that there's it's worth mentioning that sometimes we have to look at how we create the social acceptability in our own lives. The, the only difference between prostitution and pornography and the reason that there's legalization around it is because there is a camera there and you are able to label it as entertainment. It's literally the only difference, right? There's, there's a camera. We're able to say, hey, this is not reality, but we forget and we push that into the people that are consuming this, that those people on that screen are not real people. And so we, di we disassociate that what is going on behind closed doors is okay because oh they're just acting or they're choosing to want to do that and yes we get to choose society pre pre like presents with us um that we have a choice right um armand and i have brought this up a few times you have a choice if you want shit or you want garbage right you're hungry you want to eat and those are your choices yeah you have a choice but is it really a choice or is it a forced choice and as we go through looking at why people get into these things. Why wouldn't somebody want to leave a traumatizing situation? Why wouldn't you want to leave if you have the opportunity? Um, because is it really an opportunity or is it really my choice if it's out of survival? And so when we're looking at the whys and, okay, well, they have these options. Is it, an, is it all of my choices are being presented to me? Because a choice is only a choice if there's an actual tangible it, do you um, believe you, 
right? you believe you could even take that choice? You know, do I believe right. I watch? I grew up watching the the the, the Cosby Show. I seen a uh, Bill and a uh, 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 you know Miss Huxtable. I seen it, but that wasn't my reality. That was Disneyland. You know, so one thing right. of knowing you have these choices, but actually believing you can take them, having a community and parenting and a school system that fosters those and makes you and, and nourishes those those thoughts, then you then you then you go left with what the options that are left on the table: shit and trash. Yeah. And, all, and, and how we package it, right? And, how, and we're all guilty of these things and, um, and playing a role in, in allowing things to continue to be acceptable. It is much more acceptable for me as a woman, I'll speak from a woman's point, there's no shame in me going and posting a few pictures of what my sugar daddy bought me, right? Completely changes and shifts the narrative if I say what my trick, if anybody knows what a trick is, that's basically just another name for a John or a customer, um, that that is purchasing sex a buyer whatever you want to call it um i have a lot more shame around admitting that i sold my body for that versus oh my sugar daddy and so even though they're all the same it's crazy how we can just add a different name to something for it to be okay and so understanding that exploitation as a whole is just that exploitation and the question that i always pose to the women or the men that come to me um, that are questioning, do I want, do I, what's really so bad about, about being right here? Nothing. It could be nothing. But if I ask you, if you could still survive and thrive without doing what you're doing, would you make that choice to be able to not, not have to see customers? And a hundred percent of the time that I ask people that the answer is always yes. So if you're making a choice out of lack of choices, it's not necessarily a choice. And so how do we give these youth choices how do we give them the opportunity to still think on their own but have been presented with all the options and we have to be able to lay everything out on the table and let people make their own choices from that versus letting them make a choice out of lack of knowledge and then finding out later um, so the glamorization aspect of the sex industry is extremely harmful in not looking and playing out the whole picture right like we got to play the whole movie out might be good for right now for the next year but what is it going to do to my mind my family, my body, um, and my opportunity later down the line. <clears throat> and in order to be able to identify those things, we have to keep having these conversations that sometimes can feel repetitive. And we have to be including people with lived experience to be able to really bring that raw emotion and experience of what they had to go through and how they can, get, how you can get through it. Um, so yeah, the glamorization aspect is something that we're all a part of, we're all guilty of, and we all need to be able to address in order to start shifting those mindsets. Um, one of the questions I did see in the chat was, how can schools help? And um, uh, there is there, there are ways schools, schools, churches um, can help, parents can help. I, I um, you know, after doing this work for so long, realizing um, for the men specifically, that there, there's no, if you go Google, how do I help this man not be a pimp you're not going to find too many options if you even type in men and trafficking you'll find men that have been trafficked you'll find that but how do you help this man from either becoming a pimp or out of the life find that answer somewhere there's no concentration there the only thing you'll find there is incarceration or you'll find people that say kill him and I, I get it. I understand where that comes from. Please believe I do. I've heard the stories. I know the stories and why you would want that. But shift our minds into how does this, this man who is now involved in this lifestyle, he used to be your son. He used to be six years old. He used to be 10 years old. And that is not the life he wanted at 10 years old. What happened that made that fair seeming? And how do we stop that young man from doing that or even thinking that is a lifestyle for them and getting trapped up the same way. So uh, I'm like uh, Jamie said, we're super solution based. And, you know, being in this uh, anti-human trafficking movement since 2014 myself, I can't lie. I can't, I cannot point to where the movement has changed the game. We're still having the same conversations. Where's the gaps? What can we do? We've been, I've been to so many conferences across this country and beyond and we're having the same dialogue. So I'd rather focus on the solutions and, and rather than complain about it, I went and created one. So I have a, a youth mentoring curriculum aimed at young men first called um, Walk With Me Impact. 
Should, it will be out in the next couple of weeks that for teachers, for schools, for parents, and for um, and for anybody who runs a youth group, I'm actually working with with the church I belong to um, to create a faith based version of that that would be exclusively and specifically for churches to utilize. And there'll be other versions coming from that from women from uh, you know different communities specifically. So that's on the way. Uh, myself and Jamie we wrote a book. Um, called From the Streets to the Suites, which will be out this June. And that book is, is targeting people who were already in the lifestyle and really want to target people that may be incarcerated and before they come home. And that's one, this book is pointing out one of the, uh, or hitting one of the main issues of why people stay in the game. After so long of being involved in street life, after so long of being wrapped up and brainwashing yourself and having less and less self-belief, you don't think you can get out. So you stay in. If you don't think anything's better on the other side, if, if you go to these uh, service groups and you don't get the services you need or, or reject it for whatever reason, then you go back to the lifestyle and you're stuck until you're until you're just destroyed. Men and women, I've seen them at the other end of the rainbow and it wasn't a pot of gold. It was a pot of mud and they they were destroyed, literally killing themselves. If not like my friend in 2017, he was killing himself intentionally. He would end up being murdered, but he asked to be murdered. He wanted a way out on the blade in Houston. You know, um, my homegirls, it, it either it's drugs or it's really physically just killing yourself. So we want to show them a way and not just show them and tell them, you could do this, you could do that. Show them. And then also show how the transferable skills, how the stuff that they were involved in, the stuff that they may have been doing um, that for the past 5, 10, 20 years, you can actually transfer those into skills that can get you paid, not just in a job working for somebody. I'm not sending you to, nothing wrong with Walmart, but I'm not sending you there after getting fast money for so long and you want me to stop and go work for minimum wage, have somebody else sexually harassing me. Go go get my check after two weeks, and Uncle Sam then took his pimp chuck ch uh, chunk out of there. Nobody wants that, you know. They, we, you know, we grow up in the game. Job just over broke. You don't want a job. So how do you be an entrepreneur? How do you transfer those skills that you have into really paying careers, or or um or find out what do you really like? So this book that we're coming with together from both male and female um, sides of this to help people. So we the prevention side with the curriculum. The, and the um, excuse me, and then the the intervention, the intervention and prevention with the 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 book and set of worksheets that we're coming with. Um, and that that brings me into you know I guess I'll touch on um the aftercare part right because there's prevention, intervention, and then there's the aftercare. And I think the aftercare is where we are we're we're lacking in everything right. Like we're 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 out here lacking and trying to trying to just grab on whatever. But I think um aftercare for me has developed into as I've learned my journey as an advocate as what I would like my organization to represent what I want to represent as what do I want people to know like oh that's Jamie she I know for sure she's good she's about a b and c and what my core is always going to be uh, is bringing things back to humanity right and we I've mentioned I mentioned this all the time um, we talk about resources gaps lack of Yes, we need resources. Yes, we need housing. Yes, we need money. Yes, we need jobs. Yes, we need job training. Yes, we need educational opportunities. But none of that can flow evenly or work to be fully productive unless the core of the people providing those things, offering them and creating them has a caring concern and humanity aspect for the person that they're trying to create it for. And we don't necessarily have enough of that. Um, we have a lot of people trying to get numbers we have a lot of people trying to say that we want to help and we want to prevent things and we want to change things all up until it works for them and what I mean by that is that um, somebody posed a question about um, the struggles um, what I mean by how is the healing aspect the hardest part you would think that getting raped getting beat getting you know having the mental breakdowns in the lifestyle um, having to stress yourself out from traveling and doing all these things and just try to make sure that you're constantly bringing money in. You would think that that would be the worst part. Um, but because you're living so fast, it's called the fast life for a reason. Because you're living so fast, your brain literally does not have time to slow down and process what you're doing. So it's not necessarily it's traumatic in the moment, but once your adrenaline gets going, like you don't feel it till maybe the next day, maybe an hour after. 
because that adrenaline is rushing. The lifestyle is very similar to that. You're, I, went, I went, I was going, 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 trauma, trauma, every day, every day, every day, some type of trauma for years. I wasn't, so it became normal. The hard part was when I sat down and let myself feel that, that's when my, I was, I was never, I never um, got addicted to a drug the way I did ask until after I got out of the streets. And that came because I had to face my, everything that I had gone through. And so the aftercare part, we dropped the ball because we want to save people, right? We want to go in and get them. And then we forget that we got to stay with them to help them and be supported to get the skills that it takes to continue to keep them out. And we dropped the ball there because we think that, oh, you've been out of this the streets for five years, you're doing great. No, because I was living this way for 30 years. My brain needs time to re reacclimate itself to understand that I can keep this going. And it is um, tangible for me to continue um, to sustain a lifestyle that's not going to deteriorate my brain, my body, and eventually take my life. And so the aftercare part <clears throat> is where we focus um, with Sisters of the Streets. We do focus on the the right now, the needs that we need to be able to sustain ourselves and, and help people get away from their situations. But we also want to keep an open door policy and make sure that we're holding, you know, support and space for people. And how do we do that? We create community. Um, we create community. And we, we start having conversations around hearts that are going to be open to understanding not only the person they're looking at, but also internally, because every single one of us has a bias. Every single one of us, when you hear the word pimp, you think of something in your mind. That's the bias. Not right or wrong. It's just a bias. It's what we're, we're accustomed to. When, you, when I say the word prostitute, when I say the word whore, when I say the word ho, like you have an image or a concept in your mind. And whether you like it or not, you bring that to your advocacy. You bring that to your job. You bring that to your family. You bring that to your circle of people and your circle of influence. And so first and foremost, before we try to figure out how to support somebody else, we got to figure out how our own internal biases and prejudice and all of those things are projecting into our own lives. Because once we can identify and be real with that, then we can start caring about what that person in front of us is going through, what that person genuinely needs to be able to thrive and be supported through a transition in their lifestyle. And so without, without condemning, but giving accountability, first and foremost, if nothing else from this call internally, you know, turn the mirror towards yourself for just a minute to see how you are a part of the issue thriving because we all are. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be able to identify that because now we can bring that into our churches, these conversations, and we can have empathy versus sympathy to be able to want the next person's life to look a positive way. And when we genuinely care about that, that's when we can start really figuring out how to create dynamics around the resources that are needed to be able to escalate so people aren't committing suicide. People aren't overdosing on drugs because they're just trying to shut out the pain from the previous year, the, pr the prostitution or the pimping or whatever trauma they've experienced. Um, and not only are they not wanting to do that for themselves, but they know that they have a community of support people around them genuinely to be able to help them get there. And so first and foremost, before we talk about anything else, we always have to talk about what is my humanity like? Like check my humanity. Like, do I really care about what this person needs to be able to be successful? Or am I only in it for what it can do or how it can make me feel better about myself and my own life? Um, and once we can get real with that, then we can start really saying that we're out here being advocates and activists and really caring about, you know, what God has for us and how we're supposed to love others. So um, that's that's my soapbox. We're going to give the uh, National Black Faith Coalition members an opportunity just to talk for uh, make a one to two minute comment to add to this. And then we can go to questions. Uh, first of all, um, I just wanted to address the what can schools do? In the book that I wrote, uh, How You Can Fight Human Trafficking, Over 100 Ways to Make a Difference, my uh, focus was on solutions. I went up to people of every walk of life and said, who are involved in this, what can we do about this? And one thing that I was impressed with is what North Carolina did, is North Carolina had one of the highest high school dropout rates in the country. And the governor went and sat down and talked with these students in the areas where they're dropping out the most. And he said, what do you need to stay in school? And what they told him was, 
They had brothers and sisters who weren't getting enough food and they felt the need to go to work, drop out of high school and go to work because they weren't going to get a better job whether they finished high school or dropped out. It was going to be the same minimum wage job. So he got it. So what he did was he started busing high school students at the junior level over to the junior college where they learned skills. So when they graduated, they had a $45,000 to $60,000 a year job. And as a result, they went from one of the highest dropout rates in the country to one of the lowest high school dropout rates in the country. And everybody won. Obviously, the families won. The schools won because the uh, federal government gives you money for every child that's in school. So they got more money from the government. Also, businesses moved into the state because now they had a trained workforce and they collected taxes from those businesses. So the state won. So everybody won in that model. It gave people hope and it was practical. Not everyone wants to go to college and get a master's degree and become an attorney. They just want a good job. And if they have the skill set when they graduate from high school, it gives those communities hope. Yeah, no, I just want to, uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and giving us your time uh, for this important matter. But I just want to say, you know, of course, my brother, or <laughs> I love him so much. Love what he's out there doing, uh, real work um, out there where it's needed. Um, and I love what Jamie talked about. You know, they both talked about the importance of, you know, you really listen uh, to what they were really saying. It is about that mentorship. It is about walking with people. And I think that, you know, all the services that we provide, uh, the resource fairs, the education, all that's great, of course, right? We're bringing awareness. Um, it can help you get educated, you know better, you can do better. But if when people are really, really hurting and people really need it and they're in the trenches and they're in these lifestyles that Ormond and Jamie talked about, um, they need more than that. You know, they need actual community, they need actual relationships. So, um, you know, those of us who have that heart and can, though, that's where we need to go into those communities and create, if there's nothing created, create those pipelines. Um, and so what I do here, I'm based in Houston, Texas. I'm director of collaboration and strategy for United Against Human Trafficking. Um, and, you know, what we do, our main thing is coalition building. Um, and then what we do is we bring organizations together, both for-profit, non-profit, and we work with a lot of survivors. Uh, we have a lot of engagement there. We have a survivor uh, engagement committee. Um, and they're, they're there just to kind of help making sure these things that we're implementing and things of that nature really are effective. So it's evidence-based. Um, we also have a lot of programming for prevention. As we talked about, we go into the schools. We have a, a program called Real Talk. We go into juvenile hall. Um, we have a relationship with Harris County, with the DA's office. So, you know, in the world of trafficking, you have the trafficker, you have the person being trafficked, and you have the person creating the demand. So basically what we do is try to do prevention, education, and provide support for all of those. So um, I just want to thank you guys for talking about the community stuff, but I say within with survivors, um, and I we don't want people, we, I'm tired of saying survivors, I'm tired of saying it, I, I want to get to a world where we have prevented this thing enough where nobody is being trafficked because we're stopping ahead of time, we're getting involved in people's lives, and we're giving them the support they need, and exposure, exposure is everything, exposure, so when I'm saying going into those communities, going into those communities, first of all, show up so they can see something different, they can see, but then Work, if you can't do it, work with others to take them out of that community so they can see possibility. They can see these things that Ormond talked about, that here is a net, here's a tons of Black men. Bring them to an event. There's Black events going on. I'm in Houston, tech, Texas. There's Urban Leagues. There's uh, the, the historical Black fraternities. Um, I'm at Black Heritage Gangalas. I'm seeing the president of Ivy League schools that are Black. I'm seeing the head coach of Houston, Texas. I mean, there's so many events that are happening. You know, people will give money. You know, we're blessed to receive a lot of funding so that we can get people to do things like that and bring kids to see these things so they see this can be me, you know, um, and especially those communities that so I'm not making it, of course, uh, about color, but this is the black uh, fake coalition against trafficking. So we talk about those issues that affect that community and uh, in order to help you really got to understand. And if you're not working with people in that community, from that community and understanding the true needs, it's nowhere you're going to be able to help. So thank you guys for uh, giving us your true story and being vulnerable, letting us know your walk, um, those things you had to go through. Uh, you, you Ambassadors, you know, I love you guys to death for how you're allowing that pain to go to purpose. So thank you guys. Bishop Gail Oliver, who uh, has been fighting human trafficking for 23 years, been involved in this issue, and has been ministering to pimps for the last three years, um, he'd like to uh, contribute something. Go ahead. 
All right, good morning to some and good afternoon to some. And if there's anybody somewhere where it's evening, good evening, amen. And thank God for um, all those who have shared. One thing um, that hit me so heavy is it's very vitally important to continue to um, learn and to be educated as far as what's going on. And thank you so much for your testimonies, uh, Brother Aman and Sister Jamie. Um, I'm still learning, been in this, uh, uh, ooh, I think I started ministering to pimps in year 2000. So I've been doing this a long time, but I'm still learning. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of my friends, um, I met him through the ministry, but he wind up writing a, bu a book. Um, it, the title of the book is From Pimp to Preacher. So in that, uh, one of the things I learned is that he got into the lifestyle, um, like Brother Armand said, you know, he was, on, you know, raised up in the hood. It was, it looked glamorous. It looked like the thing to do, a uh, tough thing to do as well, being, a, you know, uh, gang banging and being a pimp. And uh, he thought the drugs and the women and the money, all that was glamorous. But one day he walked past some other pimps and the Lord spoke to him to let him know uh, those guys you just walked by, they're here to kill you. And so he wind up, he, he said, Lord, he was like, who is that? Where's that voice coming from? And Lord told him to get out of here now. So he ran from his, his apartment to his mother's house in a blanket, naked under a blanket. That's how afraid he was. Of, uh, he, didn't, he, he realized he didn't want to die. And so um, his mom was an evangelist. Uh, she was, a, like you said, they were raised up in the church and everything. She was an evangelist. And his, his mom knew that he must have had an encounter with the Lord <clears throat> for him to run to her house naked. And now all of a sudden he wanted to get out of the lifestyle. He thought it was, you know, glamorous and everything until his life was on the line. And thank God that not only did he get out of the lifestyle, uh, lifestyle but God has called him to preach the gospel. Um, so he tells his story and the book was so good. I wind up, I was just going to read a chapter and I wind up reading the whole book at about from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the jacuzzi. <laughs> so I'm like, I said, wow, I never knew this, you know, the depth of how he got in and why he thought it was so glamorous. And then um, for his life to be on the line. And so in that, a lot of men and women think it's something beautiful and wonderful. Um, but thank God that he had somebody praying for him. So I'm going to lead with that. Number one, we need to pray for people. First of all, um, I always ask God to help me to put the words in my mouth to minister to pimps and, and uh, whenever I'm ministering to pimps or the girls. Um, and I realize, you know, we really don't like to call the girls prostitutes anymore because back in the days, the women, a lot of women could choose the lifestyle. And so now we're talking about sex trafficking where um, the gorilla pimp may put a woman on the street by putting a needle in her arm, getting her hooked on drugs and uh, putting her on the street. And it's like she didn't have a choice. And so we're dealing with demonic, uh, uh, demonic spirits and unclean spirits. Um, uh, God just brought back to my remembrance. Uh, I had a friend of mine. I had no clue she was being groomed by a Romeo pimp. Because I didn't know anything about Romeo Pimp at the time. I just knew the word, one word, Pimp. I didn't know there was CEO Pimp, Gorilla Pimp, and Romeo Pimp. But the Romeo Pimp is still one of the most dangerous pimps because a woman or a girl doesn't see it coming. You know, it's from dating to, okay, now uh, I need you to get on the streets and make me some money. So, anyway, with that, I just wanted to uh, give everyone hope. Uh, the more we have these meetings, make sure you attend because everyone has something to offer. Like I said, I'm still learning, been in this thing for about 23 years, um, and God is still downloading and bringing things back to my remembrance. Um, so while Brother Armand, while you were talking, God dropped in my spirit, actually, the very first pimp that I met was a cousin of mine, but I didn't know he was a pimp at the time. I just thought, oh, he had a lot of women, and um, I was afraid of the, the drug part. I knew he was doing drugs, but, but I was about 12 years old when I started realizing that he had some women and all that, but I had no clue or understanding about pimping, period. But even for his lifestyle, it led him from, uh, from a gangbanger to pimping to 
uh, getting caught up in the drug on the drug side to where he got AIDS and died of AIDS. So it was nothing glamorous about that lifestyle at all, even though it seemed like it was glamorous. So with that, just want to pray that, uh, you know, God will bless everyone on this line and bless you with some hope to know that you can make a difference in somebody's life. But we got to make sure we educate these children um, at a young age to, uh, um, and be a part of, um, you know, the Bible says train up a child the way they should go. When they get, get older, they will not depart from it. So we can't be afraid to uh, educate these children and to let them know, you know, when they, they come to you, meet them right where they're at. Um, that was one of the most important things I noticed. Uh, George Foreman, his movie's coming out on April 28th, but uh, when he became a pastor, when he re uh, retired from boxing, became a pastor, he, done, he had an opportunity to minister to one of the members uh, that was going toward being a gang member and all that. Well, he just said, oh, just pray about it, blah, blah, blah. And then after the guy got shot, and then he realized I should have met him right where he was at. So I'm going to share that and uh, pray that everyone will be empowered to meet these young men and young women, young girls, right where they're at and plug into prevention instead of waiting until we have to go in and try to <laughs> rescue you. But let's pray for prevention. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And we thank God for this opportunity this, uh, this morning. And thank God for your testimonies. In Jesus name, God bless you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. That the coffee kicked in and my brain started working. <laughs> I did not know I signed up for an 8 a. I don't even know what I was thinking, but I needed a little bit of coffee. But um, something that I, I feel like is super important, too, I think um, I don't want it to get misconstrued. We talked a lot about glamorization with that. Um, it, it's very easily to digest it. Like, OK, it's understandable. Um, one so money's not always the, the pool. Right. And I think I don't want to get that misconstrued that, yes, on the surface, sometimes out of the survival it can look like the money is the issue. So then we have, there's a, there's a conflict there because now we're focused on that vulnerability um, that finances are a vulnerability, for example. So now I'm fo so focused on creating a solution around how do I get more jobs? Okay, money is a problem, money, but that's really the surface issue that comes. And I wanna address um, that the reason that a pimp is able, the reason that, that <laughs> the game is able to draw people in is um, vulnerability is not always a, a, a unmet need um, to be able to thrive, right? Like it's not just a house over my, or a roof over my head or a car or a job. Um, those deeper vulnerabilities are much harder to address. Um, the reason what a pimp has to offer is going to pull me in is because he's filling a bone, he or she is filling a vulnerability that I have, I might not even know that I have. Um, for me, it was, I wanted to feel loved. I wanted to feel good enough. I wanted to feel accepted. I wanted to feel like I was a part of something. I wanted to feel like I had someone outside of myself to help me walk through life. And so if that came in the package of a pimp, I was going to take that package. I was going to receive that because it wasn't coming from anywhere else. If I'm not being told simple things as I grow up that I'm beautiful or I'm worthy or I'm good enough or I'm these A, B, and C, the moment that somebody comes to tell me those things, it doesn't really matter what they got going on behind the scenes. All I'm really focused on is getting that need met, right? We we need we as humans need to get our needs met. And if that need is love, I'm gonna do any and everything behind what it takes to not lose that. It's dopamine. It's it's an addiction in our brain, um, outside of any type of substance that can be given to us or any type of vice. I'm going to continually crave to, to figure out how to fill, keep that person filling my need. And eventually that's going to deteriorate, deteriorate me because it's not that person's responsibility to do that, right? And so um, as we're looking at trying to figure out, okay, well, I gave, this, I gave this youth all these solutions. I told them that they had this opportunity. Okay, but what's driving their desire? Um, and sometimes we've got to take time to look a little bit deeper. Um, and that in itself is, is the reason why it doesn't matter what socioeconomic class you come from. It doesn't matter what color you are, who your parents were, et cetera, et cetera. That's why all of us, everyone on this call can be vulnerable to being exploited in some form or fashion because we all have innate desire. We all have a need inside of us. We all need to feel something. And so getting to those roots require us to really care about the person that we're talking to and supporting, right? And so, um, and that's why the humanity aspect is so important to me because I can't understand what it is that your need is unless I really care to get to know you. I really care about 
what makes you feel good, what what thrives you, right? And so um, sometimes we're we're focused on what's easily digestible because it takes too much work to look look a little bit deeper. And so I just want to encourage everybody to remember that the surface resources are not always going to be the solution. First, we got to get in depth and create a, a community and environment and spaces that help people feel supported, loved, and genuinely cared about and sought after to be able to thrive. Um, and once they Amen. know there, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I know you got, to, I want to jump in before you take me, um, that everything you're saying about um, those surfaces and finding an easy um, reason or this is why they do it, also, I, all I'm thinking about is um, I get in trouble for this, but it is the tr my truth. And my most of the women I know, I have friends, homegirls, sisters that are still in the game. They don't have a pimp. Right. So there's those, those vulnerabilities, those things that, that are um, led them into it, those root causes that aren't being, it does not necessarily take a pimp to make a girl, force a girl. So, and I, I, I'm heavily involved with a lot of people like to this day and majority of the ones I know that are still out there, the only fans that the, the, there's other root causes that are making this okay, that need to be looked at. So it's not the easy fix. Oh, get rid of this pimp and the girl. And even like yeah. pimps are heavily targeted right now. They especially specifically black men are heavily targeted right now. And you're getting a minimum 10 years, 25, just, witnessed a young man get 25 years to life with no victim with nobody that he they could associate him even dealing with but because he was talking trafficking this young man's now 25 years to life in the feds um so there's other things going on too and it it uh, this, we need to face the the root causes of this or we're never going to see it into it and there's it's not just this pimp making this girl so just want to yeah. kill that in our heads you know, I know that I've, I've heard the gorilla pimp, Romeo pimp, all these things, they, they do exist, but it's not a cookie cutter situation. And there's even uh, more common now in trending is girls that will make this guy their pimp because he's somewhat involved in the streets. He's in the, it might be a drug dealer, might be just a gang banger. And they, they want that comfort and that, that uh, companionship naturally. And I've seen girls that were in the game turn this dude out turn this boy out into being their pimp or accepting money so it is not a it, it, it's not I want to steer away from that oh this is the way it is this is what happens this pimp gets this girl he tricks her he drugs her he he forces her he threatens her and that's why she's doing it if we continue to look narrow like that because it's easier for us to understand because I get it it's hard to understand why would this girl ever sell her body for sex why it's hard for people who aren't in the lifestyle to understand that. So that's the easy out, but that is not the case. And that, that's why we keep going on this, um, on this, uh, running on this, on the treadmill, not going anywhere with the movement. And I promise you, I, I, I want somebody to show me where we have moved and the pendulum has shifted from 2014 when I got into right now, damn near 10 years, same situation, no major moves. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I have a controversial views, you know, from somebody that's really in. I'm not scared to say it. I'm not scared to, to, to say what's really happening on my end. And you may experience something totally different. That's cool. Like I said, this is not a cookie cutter thing. And what's happening in my region and my area with my set of friends might be different. And there are different forms of human sex trafficking. If we continue to put an umbrella over all of them and try to address all of them as if they're this, that's like you, you go to the doctor and you have a pain in your arm, but they, they help the, they help your foot. It, 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 no, you know, I still got the pain in my arm. You have to address, you have, you know, that's a part of going to get a, um, you can go, you know, back to the hospital, you go get tests, they figure out where the problem is coming from. And there's a specific treatment for that problem. I cannot take a, I cannot take a, a headache medicine because I, 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 I cut my toe. It's not going to work, you know? So we have to look at each individual situation the way it is, and then come with tangible solutions for that ailment and to fix that ailment, you know? And, and, that, and really quick, Susan, I promise I'm gonna be quiet after this, but, um, and what that, that God just put on my heart, like with that, um, what, how big of a part that, that creating that 
that disconnect and that cord, even between, and I'm going to use Armand and I as an example, um, that disconnect is a big part of why we can't move anywhere where we are. Um, and what I mean by, or where, from where we're at, and what I mean by that is that if I, if I am given as a woman, as a prostitute, as somebody who is doing this all on her own, right? Um, forget the pimp part, forget the trafficking part, exploitation. Um, if I'm being fed constantly that someone who identifies how Armand does or looks how he does or acts how he does or has a title of, of who, you, who he was or is, um, if I'm constantly given that he's a bad person or those things are bad things, um, that is a, a big part of where we lack solutions right there because Armand has been detri like a huge part in helping heal a lot of aspects in me that I didn't even know that I had. Um, Armand is the first platonic friend that I have had as a male, as somebody who identifies with his past, um, that helps me understand and heal a huge part of me that I didn't even know needed to be healed by simply being connected to him and simply caring about where, how he got to where he was. I took myself out of it and was able to look at like, oh, like, okay, like that makes sense why you made some of the choices that you did or why you were forced into these lack of choices. And the only way that that worked was because my mind was open to step outside of myself and not give into these labels, these types of like pimps are bad, throw them over here. Buyers are bad. We got to lock them all up. We got to quit people from wanting to buy sex. Girls are, girls are all victims. Um, prostitutes are all for it. Like we have to get those labels out of our mind and be open to understanding people's stories because everybody got where they are because of something. And so um, I just, I just, that just really opened my eyes just in this moment to see that a huge part of where we're lacking is the, the connection and why, and it just reiterates why a connection um, with other people is first and foremost so important um, beyond any, any type of label or, or community. Um, just connecting with the next person and understanding um, helps us heal so much in us. And that in itself is such a big part of the solution. And there's a discord um, within the advocacy world, because we're trying to make one group of people bad, um, while empowering another, and you can't empower one group of people if you're if you're breaking down another group. So we mm. have to come to a place where everybody is benefiting, right? And we can only do that by genuine connection. And the only way that I believe that we can create genuine connection is by putting God first and foremost, and allowing Him to work how He does, um, and really being guided by that. And so, um, just keeping that in mind that. Just because you don't understand somebody's choices or understand how somebody got somewhere doesn't necessarily mean that it's right or wrong. It just means that there's a new a new space for you to learn and really identify with how to be a good human and support that person. Um, and so, yeah, just you know, looking at the at the the solutions that are not so easily digestible and are not so easily in our face um, sometimes is going to be the biggest part in shifting shifting the narrative. Very good. And uh, to Armand's point, Karen Coleman, who works a lot in street outreach, she'll tell you she's run across these girls, this one case, 14 years old, who asked her friend at school to be her pimp so she'd have some protection. Meanwhile, because she's a minor, she's the trafficking victim and he gets in trouble. Yeah, I mean, and that happens often, like Armand said, way too often where girls, especially they're looking at social media. They're doing, you know, these, whatever, these videotapes where they're taking off their clothes, they're looking for sugar daddies, they're pimping themselves out. And uh, it's changing because they're getting educated by social media on how to do this. And it's something parents are totally unaware of. Everyone keeps saying education, it's something parents are totally unaware of. And we need to get out there and wake them up as to what's going on so that we can prevent this. Armand, so, did you want to so, make it Yeah, yeah, so so I know I, so, social media did not, it, it, has, um, it has blown up the situations that have always existed. And I'll just point to the black exploitation film, The Mac. With, uh, if you go watch The Mac, uh, the one of the most well-known uh, copied movies of, of the 70s of, of pimping, The Mac, laid in bed with a prostitute his girl who talked him into pimping this so i'll just point to that and that was made before they knew what a, a TikTok was 
And so this has always, it's been an element and not to take away from back again, it's not cookie cutter, not to take away from, yes, right. there are pimps out there that are uh, uh, talking and persuading and, and right. manipulating. And there's those sadistic ones. There's, so it's not cookie cutter. To so Arthur, go ahead. You wanted to contribute something? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you, everyone there. Um, first thing I want to say to um, goes to Jamie and Armand. I work a lot with, um, I worked with gangs. I was lucky to work with um, Diane Watson, Senator Diane Watson with Gang Truths. So I've marched a hundred times. Um, you two are very amazing wall walkers. We call wall walkers those that stand up post. So you're very amazing. And it's been a pleasure to listen to you right now. All of us on this, on this call are wall walkers, as we call it. You know, you all stand up post and that's beautiful. Um, one of the things that Susan and I talked about you take a country like Holland, um, it's a country that has a European nation, it has one of those entitlement countries that has, um, you know, you cradle the grave, um, education and, um, and health and so forth. And but yet 85% of the men and women of prostitution is legal in Holland, but 85% of the people in Holland that aren't prostitution never tell their families. And I think that goes to a lot of what James said about the vulnerabilities that bring people into this life and so forth. And um, of course, there's also about the gangs there also in Holland, about how these Albanian gangs will wait for so wait outside someone's door. They'll count the people coming in and they'll go to the front door and say, look, you know what? You owe us this amount of money. So the violence is always there. The same thing happens in America, too. There were men and women who are um, who are, who are on the sex trade out of, outside of Palenza Hotel or the Wardorf or whatever. But it doesn't mean they're outside of crime. The black market is very much into um, crime out there. That's why we know that. Um, drugs and um, breaking and entering and so forth is now below sex, sex trafficking, okay? The, the number one only thing that goes outside of sex trafficking that makes more money for, for, um, for black market now is the selling of weaponry, guns and, um, guns and um, bullets. Um, the only thing I also wanted to bring up at the very end was that there is one thing that is cookie cutter, okay? Okay, and that is what our mom was talking about with gangs. We live in a nation that has decided that some neighborhoods are throwaway neighborhoods with throwaway people, okay? And that's one of the main problems that we have, okay? We have individuals out there, we have, we have kids growing up in neighborhoods in which they don't count in this country, okay? This capitalist society has decided that they don't count enough and we are putting the resources into them. And that's why whether when our mind was down in San Diego in gangs, or in Baltimore where I'm from, my, my mom was from, and we saw the wire, that that ugliness of the wire is this true. I went back to Baltimore. We saw uh, my grandparents live in a beautiful row home area. 25 years later, it's a war zone. Why? Because those kids don't count. And until we start making sure that everyone counts, and so we have to live in, in a country that addresses violence and, and poverty on a, on, a, on a basis of everyone being included to stop it, we won't change anything. And not to not to not acknowledge that this that was by design. The redlining did it exist? Yes, yes, it, exactly. Like I said, it, it, it created these neighborhoods. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it was exactly. cookie cutter it's not by accident. Okay. Yeah, it's not at system. all. Not it at is, all. Was, this is a systematic. One hundred percent. It is all systematic. Okay. Yes, Everything sir. is systematic. There's nothing. Nothing falls by accident in a country that is steeped in violence and crime, or or the lack of mental health facilities and so forth. It is all systemic. You have decided you're going to run a nation, a corporation, and this is what's going to happen. The fallout of all the different social constructs are going to fall to pieces when you decide that. That, 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 that money is your religion, money is your God, and so forth. And so there are going to be kids that are going to be swept up into that, whether, it, whether it's um, coal miners in West Virginia or whether, whether it's young Black kids and Latino kids in poor neighborhoods, okay? And what straight happened? up racism. Yeah. Well, it was, it was racism, classism, genderism, it's all those things. But, but again, it's all about the money. You decide to run your nation a corporation, and these things will, will fester and explode when it comes to all the things that come with Comes, comes with living a decent life because some kids just don't count okay first of all i want to say <clears throat> given all given the glory to god and you know what the devil's busy but we we get the victory right and i want to thank god for aman and uh jamie um my name is karen coleman um i'm on two screens if you can see me but um at the end of the day i'm out there on figueroa i've been in this I want to say I've been in this game of, of community service for over 30, 40 years now. And I've been dealing with the, the human, uh, human trafficking aspects for the last um, 20, I want to say, and, and really intentional. Uh, and, I, and I thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Everything you said stands up. But one of the things I know is going to be a God's job. 
And, and uh, I really appreciated Armand and Jamie when they said they allowed the Holy Spirit to, to guide them into what they were going to say and how they were going to direct this conversation on this platform for the National Black Coalition Against Human Trafficking, Faith-Based Coalition Against Human Trafficking, because I had a whole direction to go today. But I'll tell you something. I read an article, and I'm going to say this really quick. I'll make it really quick, but I'm, I'm, I truly believe it's the Holy Spirit, because my walk out here and what we do on Figueroa for the last year and a half, year and a couple of months have been phenomenal. People told me all the time, Figueroa is a whole stroll. It'll never change. It'll never change. There's nothing you can do. It's not going to change. We've gone out there with food. We've taken stuff. We've met the community where they, where they were, where the girls are in the community as a whole, from the families to the to and giving them what the need was. But I'll tell you what I read today, yesterday, in the Wave <clears throat> magazine, really quick. Um, it says Los Angeles, <clears throat> a study conducted by the city, the city civil human rights and F equity department revealed an alarming high murder rate <clears throat> among black women in Los Angeles. Dated, <clears throat> dated from <clears throat> It has 30, this is a 33 page report. It indicated that black women made up nearly one third of female homicides in Los Angeles over the past decade. This is not just a law enforcement issue. It's a God's issue. It's a community issue as well. Based on this report, <clears throat> coordinated with the Civil Rights Commission Office, Racial Equality, Black Women, presented 28%, 28 28.2% of reported missing women in Los Angeles over the past two years. The report also revealed that black women account for 32.85% of the total number of female homicides in the city over the last past 10 years. In 2021, approximately 2,000 and 2,075 Black women were killed nationwide, 51% increased over 2019. The increase, <clears throat> the, the increase, <clears throat> I'm sorry, presents the largest jump of any racial or gender group during that period. According to data, data provided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Between 2019 and 2021, the number of unsolved homicides of Black women and girls rose to 89%. And I say this and I nationwide, I'm sorry, nationwide, and I say this, and my walk was so intentional so intentional and all guided by the Holy Spirit. As I was sitting around those CBO tables and all these things, and I'm not trying to exclude, I'm not trying to say I'm not for all women. I am when I'm out there, the Holy Spirit works with everybody. But I got so fed up with these African-Americans, Latino, the faces being, not my faces, and I was having to sit there as a community service director and say, you know what? We gotta fight, we gotta fight. But when he, when I walked away six years ago from my job and began this walk and made it intentional about African-American girls, and that's why this Black National Faith Coalition, I felt it was an honor to be a part of it because we're gonna direct, we're gonna make the cause, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna fight. We're going to do what it is to do to save these individuals. Everything that you guys said was correct. It's right on point. I, I trust and believe I'm out there every Saturday, twice a month. And, and if you want to come out there and you feel with the Holy Spirit and God has directed you, because the, the, the thing we have to do and that you have to remember, you guys mentioned this, is that we have to love on them. First of all, the churches have to love on these people, accept them in. Yes, I've even noticed, I've seen some stuff in churches that I couldn't even, I'm 61 years old now, and I can't, I couldn't even imagine it. But on this walk, 
It is so intentional about showing it in the church, showing it in the communities. I've been in the schools. I've done the gang intervention. I've done drug, drug and alcohol. I've talked to the kids that were on drugs. I've, I've worked in drug and rehab. I've worked in group homes. I've done all that. So I know what the problem is. And I even know now what the solution is. And the solution is to meet them where they're at, love on them, and it's going to be a God's job. And I know we have to have a cookie. It's no cookie cup plan for the whole thing. It isn't. But I'm telling you today, as we sit and breathe, we're going to have to pray. We're going to have to come together and we're going to have to go out there and put your foot on the ground and meet them where they're at. Because the schools on Figueroa, I'm just speaking of Figueroa and also in Atlanta where I just left, on Figueroa, they are feeder schools. Those are feeder schools. If all you see are, are your mama standing out there, not just your mama, your aunt, and you see them doing this and you thinking this is gonna give you $2 and two cents in your pocket so that you can do some stuff with and, and you can get some, some, some Nikes or some, some whatever it is and you see it. We've gone out there with this with Bread of Life Church and we put Bibles in backpacks along with prevention stuff for those kids. So not only do they take home the feeder schools that they are actually feeding into these elementary schools and these and these uh, middle schools right on Figueroa. That's a part of what you got to trust me when I'm telling you. So it's going to be a it has to be a God job. You cannot. You got to meet them where they're at and you got to love on them. And we as a community, and I'm going to say this too, as family members, because I was one of those judgmental people sitting in the church judging. And I, and it, it wasn't about, <clears throat> it, it was about a religion and not about a relationship with Jesus. So therefore I could judge and my nieces and nephews and so forth that were out there doing what they were doing and lost a little cousin in the, in the life. So I know that this is going to take a community is going to take a it's going to take Jesus it's going to take God and it's going to take us fighting together so i thank you for the opportunity to share i'm sorry i got so i get so i get so excited now, and we i love your passion Karen it's great but i'm fighting I'm a yes, fight. yes, you are. You have a warrior spirit. And we love that about you. And, you know, the bottom line is only God's going to end human trafficking, which is why I hyper focus on equipping the church, because really it's only this problem's way bigger than us. So like to reiterate whatever Karen said, I'm not going to repeat it, but that is where we need to focus. So um, we're coming to the completion of this event. Uh, Jamie and Armand, is there anything you want to say to complete? Um, I, did, I did get, um, I know there was a few questions. I wasn't sure if we were going to go through them. Um, I did get a, uh, one specifically to my, uh, to me directly, um, and Karen, and thank you for, yeah, just, I just wanted to, to just come in agreement with that, um, that real agape love is really important and needed and getting to that is going to be detrimental in, in creating the solutions and necessary. But, um, one of the qu questions was, is sugar, um, uh, does sugar dad does a sugar daddy or or a cougar or a sugar mama whatever you want to call it nowadays you know um does that lead into prostitution i just want to again readdress that um that's where that compartmentalization comes in right um we as society a big part of how we push and allow this to thrive without us even knowing is we compartmentalize what's acceptable and what's not and so by definition a sugar daddy is literally somebody who Use, uses leisure, uses their money to buy somebody's companionship or sexual favors. Prostitution is somebody who shares their, sells their time or sexual favors. So by definition, there is, they're, they're literally the same thing. So as a society, how we're helping push this is we are making one category socially acceptable while we'll, we'll, we'll demonizing the same thing with a different name, right? And so we do that in a lot of areas. We do that with pornography. We do that with stripping. We do that with um, webcamming. We do it with all of these things. This is okay, but this is not. I'm I'm not a buyer because all I do is click on that porn video, but I'm not going to the streets to go buy a prostitute. So I'm not one of them. I'm not a part of the problem. When in actuality, it's all connected. And so again, once we can 
connect all of those things in our mind to take accountability in our own lives, then we can start shifting to understand that it's all directly connected. It's all exploitive. It's all leading to the same end path and it's all leading to the same results. And so when we can stop accepting one area and not accepting another, that's when we can come together to create um, those consistent, constant solutions. So we're not trying to figure it out one way this way and then recreating the wheel over here. So in, sh you know, in short, yes, it's all the same. The sex industry, exploitation, trafficking, um, prostitution, whatever you want to call it, sugar babying, it's all ultimately an exploitive industry. And so the, the key is going to be what's creating the need for exploitation to meet our needs and how do we change that? And that's really what it's always going to come down to. How do we fill the vulnerability so that things that are harming us don't come in to do it themselves? Um, th thank you. Uh, everything Jamie said, that's why I love doing these um, uh, conferences, talks with her. We, I agree with everything she says, and um, it's just good coming from, you know, we didn't grow up in the game together. We came in this in our advocacy and just saw how we you know, similar minds, and we're not alone. It's not just Armand and Jamie. There's a lot of us that we we agree, and it, it you know, so we know we, we're coming from a place of um, lived experience. And with that being said, not every um, person from lived experience um, is it, just don't just go pick somebody because they've been in the game to come help you with your organization. This is what I want to say now. Just because this person, oh, you were out there in the game, you were a pimp, you were a prostitute. Well, let me come help us get, how do we help? Not every, that's like not everybody um, that, you know, worked in McDonald's need to run the corporation or help you with your systems. So don't just think because someone has lived experience, they're, they're prepared or healed enough to help you go help and heal others. So with that being said, Myself and Jamie, we concentrate on solutions. We do this work. And I know everybody in here is in the fight, or a lot, most people here. If you need help, this was an overall presentation, an introduction of sorts of who we are. But we want, I, I almost don't even want to do these type of talks anymore. But I do want to help people set up systems, set up uh, programming, set up um, understanding so that you can go be empowered to go do this work in your in, in your field even more. So if you are in need of additional help, conversations, um, uh, want to set up tangible programs and uh, to, to, to address the issue and help heal the issue, either it's prevention, intervention, awareness, call on us. You know, I don't want this to be a good show. Everybody go back. Oh, they they talked real well. Loved it. Hoorah. Oh, dude, did you go? Oh, you should have been on the call on Saturday. They had us hyped up. Cool. But we're here to help with that additional layer. So reach out to us. I'm going to put my contact in there. Jamie, please, too. Um, you know, together, separate, whatever it is, wherever your level of need is, please reach out to us because we want to help empower you with tangible solutions. I've been doing working with programming that has worked. This year marks a decade of the nonprofit I launched from my head that's helped serve women and men, children in, um, that have been involved in all forms of street life, but uh, prostitution, pimping, have helped those men and women for a decade now with high success rates, and I know how to do it. You know, So please um, feel free to reach out and um, I can help you be a um, you know operate better, guaranteed. I'm about to put my contact in here. Thank you again, Susan, for having us, inviting us, and I uh, appreciate this group. And what, I just I, I pray that God blesses you all in whatever whatever uh, corner of the fight that you're in to be successful, to help change lives. And remember, like the the the, the gardener, we are seed planters. I don't want you to be discouraged if you're putting in the effort and helping individuals and they don't necessarily turn out. It doesn't turn out how you wanted it to. You plant that seed anyway. You nourish that seed as you can. You it, What do you say? Empathy over sympathy, Jamie? If I got that correct, when you drop that jewel, empathy yeah. over sympathy, you know, how you don't hey, believe me, people in the game have been learned, have learned over the years to analyze people's intentions. 
So you analyze your intentions before you approach these individuals because they're dissecting yours. And are you being condescending? Or do you feel you're in a better place and you're better than as you're coming with your services and to help? Or are you coming like a real, how you would come at your sister, your mother, your auntie, your brother, your father, and let that lead you when you come to service people and you will develop those relationships. Empathy over sympathy. Um, contact information coming now. Thank you all. I appreciate even being her, being heard because I, I could not be. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So with that, I will, on behalf of the National Black Faith Coalition Against Human Trafficking, I want to thank you all for being here, for taking your time today. In Jesus' name, we pray that God uses us to end this exploitation of those who are most vulnerable in our society. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.